Uh, this lecture is on scientists and psychics, and the next lecture is on, which is the last lecture, is the importance of replicability. Because, as we said from the first, the important thing is if you're going to think well about any problem, you have to have good information. It's the garbage in, garbage out thing we've been emphasizing. And now you know lots of reasons why you can't trust unaided observation, intuition, personal validation, etc. And um, I want to tell you how uh, many years ago, I think, when I first got my PhD in psychology, I got fascinated by reading up, uh, reading about, or hearing about some really prominent scientists who got themselves involved with a psychic of some sort and ended up endorsing a psychic. And so I, I, I made a effort to look at every case I could find and then I was hoping, how could I study this as a psychologist? I'm an experimental psychologist. And for experimental psychologists, you get people in the laboratory and you randomly divide people into groups and give one group one treatment and another treatment. I can't go back in history and dig these guys up and uh, do experiments with them. Actually. But I did find over the years, I would go and read their, their studies. And in one case, a couple of cases, I actually hired people to translate from the French, some, some particular French scientist. Because I found that in some cases, these people wrote a lot, <coughs> were prolific, and somehow I, I thought I could see how their minds are working and figure out from that alone, get a pretty good idea what is going on here, how this person could be so competent and smart and at the same time uh, get themselves into bizarre beliefs. And uh, so I collected over the years a lot of these cases and I was always thinking of maybe writing a, psych, a book on it, and I still have all the case enough to, enough to write a book, I suppose. The hope was that, even though it's not the science that I'm used to doing, that in some ways I could, and I'm going to give you one, a couple of examples of what, how I, what I have in mind. <coughs> I could look, use their own writing, and through that writing you would see the parts of the mind and how they're getting themselves into trouble. <coughs> one thing I want to emphasize is that the, I mean, heard of Kuhn, Theodore Kuhn. Okay, uh, he he became a uh, sort of a um, hero of, of of the outsider type groups of people in science and stuff like that. Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn. The scientific revolution. Scientific revolution, uh, where he had this idea that um, science proceeds in uh, normal science as puzzle solving, and we go around solving puzzles. And <coughs> And every once in a while, within a, within a disciplinary matrix of a scientific specialty, um, you're building up uh, theories and stuff like that, and you keep adding a, little, a few more things to the system and keep tweak, uh, tweaking it every once in a while. But every once in a while, with any, within any scientific field, there's enough tweaks, enough, enough um, anomalies, as he called them, that accumulate. So it's too much. And eventually this leads to a complete revolution, an overthrow of the old system, and, and this chaos, and then the new system super takes over, and now you're back to normal science again. And then they went to this big, big, big revolution again. And this was very controversial, and it still is. Um, it's not as clear cut as that, and many things he called revolutions mm. could be seen as revolution, but also could be seen as this with science as usual. But anyways, uh, he uh, used the term uh, paradigm. And that's why the, all the new ages and stuff like that, paradigm is the other, is their most used word. After, uh, and you don't hear it so much anymore. But everyone was, was talking about a new paradigm. Parapsychologists were saying they're creating a new paradigm. And all these other people who were trying to be, uh, thought they were going to challenge the establishment, they're going to create a new paradigm. And uh, a lady, uh, I'm trying to think of her name, I think her name was Masters, uh, during one symposium, it's in a book, uh, 
she uncovered 42 separate uses of the term paradigm in, in, in his book on scientific revolutions, and they're all incompatible with one another. <laughs> he admitted that. In the later article, he said, she's right. And I did was inconsistent with the use of paradigm. And so he restricted paradigm, and he changed what he really meant, originally meant by paradigm. He, he, he called it disciplinary matrix. Well, he, what he meant by disciplinary matrix, he meant that in any field, well-developed field of science especially, there is a, um, uh, a, is a confluence of facts that they've accumulated, theories, hypotheses, but even more than that, of uh, ways of understanding how you go do this kind of a research, what kinds of instruments you, you need, uh, what controls you need, and what controls you don't need within this field, and you, all that becomes, and, and ways of doing things, that becomes part of the disciplinary matrix. And within any field of science, as well, especially well-developed ones, you're working within a disciplinary matrix. And the reason I want to bring that up is because I think that's a very important concept to help us explain how it is that top-notch scientists, the ones I've paid attention to, many of them just uh, go out and test psychics suddenly and they fall for everything. And it looks like they're, it's ridiculous. How could they competent scientists do non-science and think they're doing science? And it dawned to me finally, uh, after reading what they say and, and figuring it all out, that most scientists are not aware of what they're doing. In other words, they learn implicitly. By, they, they become um, like apprentices. Many, most of the scientists, you apprentice. You have postdoctorates and stuff like that. Then you work with colleagues, and first you have your, 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 your supervisor. And you eventually, you implicitly absorb what we call the aspects of the matrix. So you implicitly know what to do in your field. You implicitly know if you want to figure out whether this guy's experiment was correct or not. You explicitly know what questions you should ask and what you would have to do to, uh, to, fig to do it right or wrong. And you understand these things, but it's implicit. Very few scientists can explicitly tell you what, what is good science. That's why the philosophers of science is trying to tell them that. And, um, but some scientists do write about what science is, and they are more explicit about it. But most scientists, even the best of them, they're good in their fields, but they're not, they can't tell you why, what, why they're good. They don't understand why they succeed as good scientists. They can do good science. But when they step outside of that matrix, they, they don't have the, that, that, that supporting context they don't have the uh, background, all that information, what we call the good mindware, uh, that's, a, that's, that, that's implicitly under, underlying everything they do in this field. They don't realize that they're outside of that. that this field can be consistent, be thought of as a, I'm not supposed to move around like this, uh, <laughs> as a safety net. Uh, being, so as long as they're working within their disciplinary matrix, they have the, the safety net. Now safety net keeps them they, they, the safety net consists of, of, of colleagues, but also rivals within their field, and they know what the rivals are going to say if they do this and that. So they are always aware of these things, and it keeps them honest and keeps them also uh, from doing boo-boos. And this is how they can be good at their field. But they don't understand that, so when they leave their field, they get to go and study a psychic. Uh, this is the, so this is one of the things. Okay, now, I can go to other reasons for that, but I'm, I want to jump to, uh, rather than talk about it, I want to give you, tell you some of the examples of the past, but I don't want to get into detail so that we don't have the time. Uh, there was Sir William Crookes, a uh, very famous uh, chemist physicist, uh, at, at well, just before the turn of the, of the ninth, uh, he was in the late, middle, late 1800s. And he uh, did some, obviously some, he was editor of his own journal uh, in uh, physics, and um, he was a well-established scientist, but he became also notorious, you might say, or famous, whichever, whatever side of the issue you're on, uh, for dealing with Daniel Douglas Hume, 
H O M E is his name. He spelled his name, but he called himself Hume. He was from American, but uh, there was he thought he had uh, a Scottish ancestry, and, um, and maybe he was related to the famous David Hume, uh, was one of his ancestors, perhaps. So that's why he called himself Hume. He is known as the even today among parapsychologists, especially, it's like, is that the one medium who never was caught cheating of any kind. Well, he was never caught cheating because he never, he never allowed himself to be tested by any inadequate way, but he, has, but he still has this reputation of never being caught cheating. He, he was got a famous reputation. I won't go into all the details. But the only time he was scientifically ever tested at all was by Crooks. Crooks did some experiments with um, uh, Hume, Hume, and he had some, uh, I won't go into it, he had some, he, he made some special equipment and uh, he said that Hume was able to move, have a lever move, supposedly by spirits, you know, uh, without touching it and so on. The other uh, thing he said became notorious for was Florence Cook. She was a young, uh, sort of attractive, supposedly, um, spirit who could materialize a, a, um, uh, a psychic, a, 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 a spirit who came from the other world, but who once lived in this world. And those people who attend the seances with Florence Cook at um, uh, Cook's home were very much impressed with how wonderfully similar to uh, Florence that this uh, spirit medium looked, I mean spirit that came from the spirit world, she materialized. And uh, when she materialized, Florence Cook was supposedly in a trance behind a curtain. But she never saw the two together, okay. And so a lot of people were suspicious of it. And for some reason, even though Crooks claimed he'd done scientific type of work in the laboratory with Hume, with her, he just described the phenomena, took pictures. But, um, and at one point he did say he did see them together, but uh, it was very vague. So that was a notorious case. I won't go into details, I just want to give you the kind of case. Alfred Russell Wallace is my favorite of all. Uh, he's the co-founder with uh, Darwin of the theory of evolution by natural selection. In fact, many people think he, what happened was that Darwin's working for years on the theory and uh, not willing to ready to publish yet because there's always some things he still might have to work out. Wallace, uh, living out the, in the East Indies and stuff like that, what we now call that, uh, in the jungles all by himself, gets into, gets uh, uh, type, one of the fevers there from the, um, uh, the fevers out there, and malaria maybe. And he's uh, in his camp all by himself, uh, high fever, and he gets this big idea, which is basically the theory of natural selection. And he writes it out, and he sends it to the only person he knows in the field back in England, it was Charles Darwin, he's heard of. And, and this created a, you know, this big dilemma for Darwin. What does he do about it? This guy got his theory. It's, it's, it's scooped him in a way. But they made a, uh, the powers that be uh, realized what the situation was. They fixed it up very nicely and they had a joint paper. And it was called the Darwin Wallen theory for a while, or the Wallace Darwin. Many people have put it the other direction, the Wallace Darwin theory for a while. You don't hear about Wallace anymore in relation to that. And you don't hear about it because soon after he came back to England, after the years out being, uh, picking plants and sending, being a naturalist out in the wilds, he uh, uh, became friends with Darwin and all the other people, although he was from the lower class, self-educated. Almost all the scientists at that time were very wealthy people who had the time and the money to carry out research. And Wallace was an outsider. He, was very poor all his life, and he always was struggling to make money and stuff like that uh, by somebody to keep himself going so he could do his research. Top-notch scientist, though, in many ways, as a naturalist, and he's known for the Dow uh, Wallace line, and he did some other famous things. But today he's not that famous, and many biographers think he's not that famous because it became an embarrassment. Uh, he even challenged his own theory of natural selection after, after being the major champion of it when he got back to England. He said it doesn't apply to the higher spiritual levels of man. That's an exception. And uh, 
That came about because he would get sitting in on seances when he came back, and one of his own, his house lady, house worker, um, uh, she became also a medium and, and produced some phenomena for him and stuff like that. Okay, so that's a big, and many other things that Wallace defended. Wallace was, his whole life he defended phrenology and stuff like that. At the same time, doing a lot of very good work. And it's hard to dislike the guy. I've read almost everything he's ever written. He's very prolific. He lived a long life to his late 90s. And um, obviously a smart guy, but self-educated, never was, had the opportunity to go through any colleges and stuff like that. And a very likable guy. And you read his arguments for, for, for phrenology and stuff like that. They're fascinating. And, but you learn how his mind works. And uh, then there was uh, several others. We can go all the way down there and several famous ones. But I'm going to jump down to the present. Because we already talked about Russell Targ. And uh, I mentioned also his buddy, Harold Puroff, who were the two physicists at the time I went to Stanford Research Institute in 1972. And I told you the story. They were studying Uri Gellin. OK, there were t some other scientists that also looked at Uri Gellin. And in uh, about 1974, I think it was, uh, Nature, the top general science magazine in the world, a very conservative, published a paper by Hasted, John Hasted, and um, David Bohm, some of the very top science uh, physicists you could you could get together in England, about five of them, and. Uh, it was on there, uh, ideas about how you study someone like Uri Gellar, how you deal with a uh, person like Uri Gellar. And now I want to show you how you can get into the minds of these people by what they write, even. Here we are. So this is a later book by one of the people uh, that, that, was st that wrote this thing. This is the cover of a book called The Metal Benders, John Hasted, one of Britain's top physicists at the time. Uh, he passed away only, only fairly recently. But Hasted, here, let me get this down so you can see the top of it. There it is, right there, okay. Uh, I just want to show you the cover of his, one of his major books on primary, he called this primary metal bending. And he not only studied Geller, but he studied a lot of other uh, or children, especially, that he studied who could apparently, after seeing Geller, they could bend spoons as well and metal. And so he did a head, dead voters laboratory and was a major supporter of uh, the reality of the thing. But here was this article that appeared in Nature in 1975, okay. It was 1972 that Geller burst on the scene here. That's when I went to see him at Stanford Research Institute. But John Hasted, David Bohm, those who have, know about physics or history of science, so David Bohm is one of the top men uh, at the time, and Baston and O'Regan, uh, other side physicists as well. So these four physicists wrote this article and got it published in uh, Science and, and Nature, rather. And the point of the article was uh, when you're studying someone like Uri Geller, a, a psychic or a claimed psychic like Uri Geller, you can't treat him as like he's a particle or something like that, like a, or an object. You've got to realize that you're dealing with a sentient human being who has feelings and stuff like that. So this is an article that they wrote in Nature on how you have to deal with a, a psychic like that. Uh, it's strange you never consult a psychologist who's dealing with real people all the time, or almost real people, college sophomores, but they're going to come real people sometime. Okay. <clears throat> so. I'm taking these quotes. I just want to show you that you go even to their scientific articles and you can see that we can learn something about how the minds are working and how they can get themselves into trouble. These are physicists. They never, and physicists don't know anything about people at all, right? You know that. They, they get in their laboratories and they look at bubble chamber, chambers, you know, uh, and uh, they look at equipment and stuff like that, but they never see any living thing, right? Okay. So now they, but they are confronted by Gell. They've had some experiences with Gell, and he does things that, wow. And they have no idea how, how it happens, so they feel this is, this is worth, important to study. So we have come to realize that in certain ways, the traditional 
ideal of completely impersonal approach of the natural sciences to experimentation will not be adequate in this domain. This domain to mean studying psychics like Geller. Rather, there is a personal aspect that has to be taken into, the, into account in a way that is somewhat similar to that needed in the disciplines of psychology and medicine. Why didn't they call in psychologists and medicine? They, 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 they're at the universities and they, they have colleagues there. Don't they talk to one another? Well, that's strange, okay. This does not mean, of course, that it is not possible to establish facts which we can count securely. And remember, the whole point of this course is how to have facts that you can count on before you think. It's, it's, if you're thinking with facts that you don't know, you can't count on as being secure, then you get, you're having what we call contaminated mindware. And contaminated mindware is one of the major reasons how intelligent people can be stupid, right? Rather, it means that we have to be sensitive and observant to discover what is a right approach, which will properly allow for the subjective element and yet permit us to draw reliable inferences. So as scientists, you can, uh, they want to draw reliable inferences, but they realize they're going to have to not do it quite the way a physicist does it. So in the study of psychokinetic phenomena, psychokinetic phenomena, don't, don't, don't know, how many don't know what psychokinetic is? It's moving things Yeah, that's right, exactly. The idea of psychokinesis is that part of parapsychology which has to do with mind over matter, okay? So in the study of psychokinetic phenomena, such conditions are more important than in the natural sciences because the person who produces the phenomena is not an instrument or a machine. Any attempt to treat him as such, uh, this is before they had to say him or her, I guess, but any attempt to treat him as such will almost certainly lead to failure. Rather, he must be considered to be one of the group, actively cooperating in the experiment and not a subject <coughs> whose behavior is to be observed from the outside in a cold and impersonal manner as possible. I suspect there's one reason they didn't want to bring in psychologists, because we are people, call our people we study subjects. I guess I think that's a bad, that's already so something bad. Isn't that right, Barbara? Okay. Anyway, so we see there, there's a start of a problem here, right? We have found also that it's generally difficult to produce a predetermined set of phenomena. Although this may sometimes be done, what happens is often surprising and unexpected. Now, if we go back to the first lecture on key bending, the reason I did it is because I want to emphasize that when you don't know what to expect, you can't rely on what is described afterwards, right? It's very important to have a plan. This is the whole point of science is that they have to plan their observations so they know what to expect what to look for. But they find that uh, you, studying psychics like Geller, you can't do that. Because what happens is often surprising and unexpected. And of course, if you're a magician or a deceiver, you want it to be surprising and unexpected. If it's expected, they'll catch you. Okay. We've observed that the attempt to concentrate strongly in order to obtain a desired result, for example, the bending of a piece of metal, tends to interfere with the relaxed state of mind needed to produce such phenomena. <laughs> These guys are getting themselves into real tr trouble here, right? However, they're, they're aware that, they're, that this is going to create problems and that some people are going to say, hey, you're setting yourself up to be tricked. They're not stupid people. They're, as I said, they are, at that time, the most eminent physicists in England. Um, and sometimes in the world, perhaps. One of the first things that reveals itself as one observes that, did I just, is this a duplicate of what I just had there? Oh no, okay, it, it's closed. Uh, is that psychokinetic phenomena cannot in general be produced unless all who participate are in a relaxed state. <laughs> Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but if you're doing experiments, you want to not be too relaxed because you, gotta, you want to be at the right moment. You want to be focused on what's going on. Okay, a feeling of tension, fear, or hostility on, then, on, the, on the part of any of those present generally communicates itself to the whole group. 
The entire process goes most easily when all those present actively want things to work well. <laughs> in addition, matters seem to be great. By the way, this is published in the major magazine, science magazine in the world, right? Uh, in addition, matters seem to be greatly facilitated when the experimental arrangement is aesthetically or imaginatively appealing to the person with apparent psychokinetic powers. Okay? This is what I love. This will be the last one I'm going to give you a quote from them, but uh, I, I still can't believe it. Okay. How then are we to avoid the possibility of being tricked? They're aware of that. They, that they're setting themselves out to be tricked, they, but they, they want to avoid the possibility, but still be uh, not, not antagonized or not, not threaten the, the phenomena they're studying. It should be possible to design experimental arrangements that are beyond any reasonable possibility of trickery and that magicians will, magicians will generally acknowledge to be so. In the first stages of our work, we did in fact present Mr. Geller with several of such arrangements. Notice that they've presented Geller, they actually worked out arrangements they thought could be, meet all their conditions and yet uh, uh, be, be, be devoid of trickery. But, these proved to be aesthetically unappealing to him. And of course, they've already said in the previous statement that it's very important that everything be aesthetically appealing to the person. And unfortunately, this was us. And so he couldn't get away with that. OK. They were hoping in that article, they, the whole point of that article, they were writing that they had, that had some, a lot of experiments with Geller, but they realized they'd, that there was uh, magicians and other, and other scientists weren't going to approve of, of, of their controls and stuff. So they were showing that the reason they had to be not, not had the kind of controls that scientists ordinarily would use in a physics laboratory is because of the nature of the subject matter and the sensitivity. But they also wrote this article show, but, but they had no doubts, they had confidence that they'd be able to develop the right kind of arrangements that would uh, not threaten Geller or, uh, or inhibit him, but, but still be, uh, avoid the possibility of any trickery. And of course, they never did get, Gail never came back to be tested for them, and that, that never happened. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about related to that, which relate things, is that um, uh, in uh, 1967, 87, I'm sorry, Deborah, so we're about a, little, about, a little more, about 10 years, just about 10 years, no, same year. 1987. Oh, no, uh, that was 1970. Yeah, okay. So this is about 10 years later. Deborah Delanoy, I think she still is, is a, par was a parapsychologist at the um, uh, uh, laboratories, uh, the parapsychological laboratories set in Scotland by the, uh, some fund, I forget the name of the fund. They established a fund uh, for parapsychological work, and I wanted to it was at Cambridge, but Cambridge didn't want it. And so they offered it to Oxford, Oxford didn't want it. It became a kind of a scandal thing, and that, that all this money for a Department of Parapsychological Research was being offered to the major universities, and major universities did not want it. So finally, the University of, Edin of, of Edinburgh uh, in Scotland uh, took it, set up a department, and they had Robert Morris, a very good parapsychologist, and I was a good friend of mine, actually, uh, high respect in some ways. And Robert Morris took over. He was a parapsychologist, a believer, but a very good one, a very careful person. And um, took over. And his strategy to sell it to the rest of the people in the University of Edinburgh, because this is controversial, was that he made the department a parapsychology department, but also one that studied deceptions and ways people can be tricked. And you could get a degree in either one or combine the two, parapsychology under him. And one of his and Roger is now probably one of the top skeptics and top uh, people in England and all over the world, actually. And he has websites and books galore, and he is quite a guy. And he was at, was he at Tam this year? He's been at a number of Yeah, a number of Tams, right. And um, a very colorful person, and obviously a good skeptic, does skeptical work. And his girlfriend, though, is a parapsychologist from the univer at the University of Edinburgh, and I don't know how they get along, but uh, they maybe get along like other people I know who are mixed that way. They just don't discuss it. But uh, she's very good, though, but uh, uh, anyway. 
So, let me give you some quotes. Oh, at Delanoy, Deborah Delanoy at the University of Edinburgh, uh, the parapsychologist, she, uh, this uh, young uh, high schooler, uh, came to her laboratory and said that he wanted to be tested because he has psychokinetic powers. He can bend spoon with his mind and stuff like that. And uh, she was charmed by him and was thought it was plausible. And he seemed a nice fellow and she liked him. And so she did some experiments with him. And actually, ultimately, took um, well over a year, I think, that they spent. He would come into the lab and do things with him. They weren't quite pinning it down. They then, at one point, uh, contacted Randy. Uh, because one thing he did, one time he came into the laboratory with, by the way, every time they did think they had the cameras on him, they put him on, leave him, I'm sorry, but they had the cameras on, camera on him, a camera on him. Nothing would happen in the range of the cameras, but outside the range, things would happen. Uh, Fires started, or, or metal would bend, and stuff like that. But by the time he was the cam under the camera, it just didn't happen. And so it was very, uh, you know, it was just like what was going on in SRI earlier. But one day he came into the laboratory and he had a, there's these puzzles, these, uh, it's in a plastic uh, box, you know, it's like a square, a cube, and there's a coiled uh, thing in there where you have a, a little ball and you, it's a puzzle where you try to move it while everything's sealed in that thing there. He came in and the track, the, the metal uh, uh, tube or whatever that's in that thing had been twisted in, in, in a very interesting way and the cube was still sealed. And he said, he just looked at it and that's what happened, it bent like that. And they couldn't figure out any way this could have been done, but they sent the cube to Randy. He mailed it to Randy. And Randy uh, is excellent at this. By the way, Randy is good, one of the best psychic investigators and stuff like that, not because he's a magician. He says it's because he's a magician. That's why the people say, you always have to have a magician. Magicians are fooled, were very badly fooled by Geller and very bad, there's a history of magicians endorsing psychics and stuff like that. A magician, because they are a magician, are not necessarily the best person to catch trickery by psychics. Uh, most magicians, when Geller came along, didn't know anything about spoon bending or how he bent it and stuff like that. And some magicians made a fool of themselves by endorsing Geller as a psychic. And one uh, in England, a well-known magician, I won't say his name, actually still insists that Geller, he's a good friend of Geller's, and he still insists that Geller has some real powers. Uh, so magicians, and throughout history, there have been magicians who endorsed, they're like, like in the world of science, you can find scientists who go and endorse psychics, but you also find magicians who do it. Uh, so Randy is great because he's a Renaissance man. He knows lots of things. People don't realize that Randy knows quite a bit about science, even though he wasn't educated in it. He knows a lot about other things. He is a, uh, a, what you call a polymath. He knows lots of things. And so Randy looked at this box. He knew what to look for. He knew how to study it. And he could see that it had been tampered with a little bit, how, how they'd opened it. And he, so he sent that back to them and was showing how it had actually been opened. He could see it when he pointed out. They he could see it. They hadn't been able to see it until he pointed it out. He also sent them back another box, which he said, if he tampered with it, this one, that would, they would be to leave it. They had to fix it so that the, it was tamper proof in a sense. If he tampered with it, it would leave a, uh, a, 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 a trace. And of course, he wouldn't do anything with the new box. He couldn't. But even that, even their contact was Randy. And they talked to Randy, communicated with him. Otherwise, he gave him some advice what to do and stuff like that. But still, they continued with this guy. And he kept coming back. And I said, for about a year and a half, maybe. Okay, so eventually, and by the way, they had two cameras, but they only kept one camera on. The idea was that they, it would be immoral, unethical to put a secret camera on it. That's, so they had that kind of thing. But they finally, Randy, I guess maybe convinced them, they finally got to the point after working with them so long and nothing, not being able to capture anything, they finally also used a hidden camera and everything blew up at that point. They discovered it was fraud, cheating him. Okay, so here's just two quotes from her. During the time we had worked together, I felt I came to know Tim fairly well. We had established what, had, what appeared to be an honest, friendly, and trusting rapport. If he was fraudulent, 
I thought he either deserved an Academy Award for a most convincing performance or that he was prone to severe self-delusions at the least. By the way, uh, this is a problem all the time, is when people assume that they can tell, judge people's honesty or sincerity, uh, we got trouble, okay? You, on the other hand, you can see what's going on here. These people feel they want to do this because uh, they really are, they feel that you're dealing with a sensitive human being, you've got to treat them as a sensitive human being. Unfortunately, you're in a, in a uh, catch-22 situation. If you really let them be part of the, the process and stuff like that, you are opening the door to, you know, I could fool, even I could get away with all, uh, anything under those conditions. They're going to give me the keys to the uh, storeroom. Okay. Why had I been willing to give Tim's PK ability the benefit of the doubt when evidence was against doing so? In considering this question, I discovered two aspects of my relationship with Tim which may have contributed to my apparent reluctance to recognize that Tim's claims were false. Firstly, I was biased towards liking Tim, both initially and as our relationship developed. Secondly, I was biased towards believing him. So this is how she explains that. I can find that of interest. So what we're talking about always throughout this course and the using the framework and stuff is how to make sure you've got good evidence or to be sure you have good evidence before you begin thinking about it. Not to, uh, and so I go back to one of my favorite people. Claude Bernard was a um, uh, very important person in medicine, the beginnings of medicine, and he helped establish the experimental basis for medicine. And his book, I'm trying to remember, the, An Introduction to Medical Research or something like that, it's still a, it's in paperback in Dover, and I, it's my favorite book, among many other things. He was well ahead of his time. And this is a quote I, I love of his, which I think is very sensitive, central to this course. A good method promotes scientific development and forewarns men of science against those numberless sources of error which they meet in the search for truth. This is the only purpose of the experimental method. Think about that. Uh, a second quote from the book, which clinches it for me. If the facts used as a basis for reasoning are ill-established or erroneous, everything will crumble or be falsified. And it is thus that errors in scientific theories most often originate in errors of fact. And uh, again, as I say, it's a recurring theme in this course. Uh, and it's the garbage in, garbage out. And it's the uh, basis for several things I've been pointing out here. Okay, and it's what uh, Stanovich would call contaminated mindware. And once you have you have in your memory and everything else, you have contaminated mindware. Your thinking, is, unfortunately, is going to be very, very problematic. Another thing related to this is Richard Feynman. Uh, and uh, in his fascinating book, Cargo Cult Science, uh, Feynman said this, the first principle of science is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. Keep that in mind. So you have to be very careful about that. After you've not fooled yourself, it's not easy not to fool other scientists. You just have to be honest in a conventional way after that. So that's the other important thing. Now we jump to some psychology here, also related to the fact that um, good mindware, in other words, having good mindware, good knowledge and good facts, as well as being able to know when to allocate your precious cognitive resources is the best thing you can do in trying to uh, think correctly about dubious claims. Uh, these are two psychologists who study, um, have a long history of studying logical thinking and stuff like that. They say, when an argument is compatible, its conclusions seem probable, and it is unlikely that there will be a fallacy in it. Hence, there is little justification for engaging in a mentally, mentally costly deliberative search of memory. 
In contrast, when an argument is incompatible, its it conclusion seems improbable, and it is not, it's likely that it contains a fallacy. Consequently, there's a good reason to devote extra mental effort, mental work needed to find a fallacy. Now, this is, could be very controversial, actually. What, what's his definition of compatible? Compatible is that uh, when someone is making, comes up to you and says, look, I just did an interesting experiment where I uh, tested uh, therapeutic touch and it doesn't work. There's a, lady, a, a young girl at the time, uh, Emily Rose, you may have heard about her, and she uh, did an, a, as a science fair project at her school, she was 11 or 12, I think, 12. She tested uh, some ther therapy with touch people to see whether in fact they could detect when they couldn't see where, where a hand was here or over here, you see, by just, because they, they claim they can you know, feel uh, auras around the body. And she, with the science fair project, she uh, showed that, that they couldn't do it, apparently. Well, this is compatible with uh, apparently the JMA and a lot of other skeptics, uh, skeptical scientists and medical people who don't believe in therapeutic touch. So, so. And then, so Emily Rose's science fair project got published as a JMA paper. So it's that was it. compatible with what you already think? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what compatible means. Yeah, that's what it means. What's that? Is that similar to Occam's razor? Well, no, what, what he's saying, as I understand, what he's saying is that, look, when someone comes along with a proposition, a statement that's consistent with what you already believe or know, you don't spend much time thinking about it. You don't, you don't waste your time thinking about it. But if someone comes along with something that is incompatible with what you know, so if Emily Rose had tested those um, people in her little experiment and they had uh, come out with uh, sh uh, she came out saying, hey, buddy, it, it worked. They can detect where my hand is better than chance. She would have gotten flack from everyone. Every skeptic in the world would have turned her experiment apart, which is very easy, because no experiment is perfect. And she's a little girl at a science fair, and it was just a very simple experiment. But it was so pleasing that it did come out the way a lot of people wanted it to come out, that the Journal of the American Medical Association even published it. Mm -hmm. They're very tough at what they published. So because it was compatible with, what, with their viewpoint. Uh, so, but, so this is it. But this can be a dangerous approach, but yet there was sense to this. They want to make the point that, in fact, if we always are questioning everything the same way, we never get through the day. And in fact, there's some sense to doing that, but, but you also got to realize there's some problems with it. But anyways, I'm going to push that issue there. I, I've used that to get into this. Here's a phosphorus science. Mistaken beliefs will, as a result of belief perseverance, I mentioned this earlier, belief perseverance, which is a psychological term, will taint our perception of new data. So this would be like what our new terminology we've been talking about in this course. This is like saying uh, contaminated mindware uh, because of belief perseverance, perseverance, I'm sorry, perseverance, will taint your perception of new data. It's another way of saying that, however, whatever your background, whatever knowledge you have is going to color, you can't help it. You, you always got to approach any new data or any new objects of that with, in terms, uh, against the background of what you already know. So by the same token, however, belief perseverance will serve to color our perception of new data with our pre-existing beliefs when our pre-existing beliefs are accurate. So what he's saying simply is that, look, if you have um, mistaken beliefs, and you take in new data and you simulate it to those mistaken beliefs, you're going to be wrong. You're just increasing your... On the other hand, he said that that's a good, bad feature of it, of our belief perseverance. But on the other hand, at the same token, if in fact your beliefs prior to coming encountering new data are correct, when you encounter new data and interpret, and interpret in terms of your current beliefs, you're going to be even more correct, right? So he wants to point out that there's another side to the coin. And I'm pointing this out for another reason. How many have heard of uh, Reed St. Matthew? Uh, I know about St. There are several versions of this, but this is famous. This is uh, according to the Gospel, according to St. Matthew. For unto everyone that hath shall be given. You've heard this before? And he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not, 
shall be taken away even that which ye have. This is the principle of, uh, of Republican uh, economics. <laughs> the rich, rich get, should, get, uh, should get richer and the poor should get poorer. This is the basis of it, right? Uh, this is the idea why they, why they, hope they don't want any more tax proposals going uh, to touch that very rich upper 90, uh, upper one percent of the well, we were very wealthy. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a religious gospel with them, apparently. Um, anyways, this is a famous thing. It's called sometimes it's used in sociology by Merton uh, to. Uh, he called it many years ago. He was a sociologist of science in the good sense. There are sociologists of science now who, who are really anti-science. But um, anyway, Merton applied to call it the Matthew Principle. Uh, the, the principle, the, in the Matthew Principle, he wanted to show how fame gets about, the, if you become famous very early in science, that makes it easy to become even more famous if you very early begin your career in, uh, uh, without any, any uh, knowledge, without anyone knowing about you, it's going to be much harder as you progress in your career to get any, you're going to get more and more going to the backwaters and become un unknown. That's the Matthew Principle. So the idea of the Matthew Principle is that uh, things develop, in other words, those who start with an advantage are going to have even more advantages. It's going to multiply. And those who start with disadvantage, it's going to get worse. Uh, and so that's the idea of the Matthew Principle. It's used a lot of ways. It's used by psychologists who are reading to, to try to show that early getting kids to begin reading very early, as early as you can, is a very helpful one. And so children who grow up in families where, where they're encouraged to read and stuff very early uh, gather uh, certain kinds of modules in their mind and stuff like that, which makes it easier to now read new things and read better things. They get better and better and better. Whereas you start off in a disadvantaged environment where there are no books and no one encourages you to do that, you get, you get worse and worse as, the, as, as the, you go up the educational scale. That's called the Matthew Principle and it's applied to reading. But as we see, it's also applied to uh, how come scientists and smart people can go badly wrong. And the idea comes from the idea of knowledge projection. Here's how Keith Sandwich puts it in his book, Who is Rational? This argument that in a natural ecology where most of our prior beliefs are true, projecting our beliefs onto new data will lead to faster accumulation of knowledge. I will term the knowledge projection argument. So that in the natural state of things, if you, most of your prior beliefs about the situation are true beliefs, uh, you will accumulate more and more new data, which will be consistent with your true beliefs, and you get, you'll be even smarter, okay? Thus, knowledge projection, which in the aggregate might lead to more rapid induction of new true beliefs, may be a trap in cases where people, in effect, keep reaching into a bag of beliefs that are largely false. Using these beliefs to structure their evaluation of evidence, and hence more quickly adding incorrect beliefs to the bag for further projection. So if you're starting with false beliefs you, and you start going, going further, you're going to build up even a, a bigger, get more and more uh, into a uh, situation where you believe in falsely. Uh, you can, without going further, you can begin thinking how you can apply it to scientists who go astray. Within their disciplinary matrix, they've already built up through other scientists and through a whole, whole uh, matrix, this matrix, they built up a body of beliefs, well tested over and over again, of good information. And so when they come to new information, new experiments, they can assimilate that new stuff, the, the new information to the old stuff, tweak the old stuff so it's even better, and they, their total amount of information out of useful and good information, and correct information, is even bigger. By, um, so on the other hand, that same thing goes uh, with the persons people start with wrong information. Now, when a scientist is in his matrix and he steps out of that matrix, begins looking at spiritual mediums and stuff like that, the only information available is the stories, not scientific information, by people who believe that they do see spirits and these spirits really can do what they claim, or 
if they start to work with Geller, they step out of their physics laboratory and work with Geller, only thing they can see is that, and they've heard stories about it, that's why they go to see Geller, that this guy can bend metal with his mind. So they're already starting with a, a, a basis of, not, of, of wrong beliefs. They already get the idea that this guy really can bend metal with his mind. They start that way, and the knowledge they accumulate things are going to get worse and worse, deeper and deeper into uh, poo poo, you know. Uh, so they're in trouble. So this is called the Matthew effect when we apply it to why scientists go astray. And again, I'll quote from Who is Rational by Keith. Knowledge projection from an island of false beliefs might explain the phenomena of otherwise intelligent people who get caught in a domain specific web of falsity and because of projection tendencies cannot escape. They cannot escape otherwise competent physical scientists who believe in creationism, for example. And indeed, such individuals often use their considerable computational powers to rationalize their beliefs and to ward off the arguments of skeptics. This is another point which I should have made, but I will make now. Uh, I could have made earlier, but I'll make it now. Is that one of the ways, in fact, I, uh, there's a book called Who is Stupid? Uh, Why Smart People Can Be So Stupid? That was the title of a book that a collection of articles by experts on this. Um, uh, by Robert Sternberg. It's, I think we, about 10 years old now, no less than 10 years old. And Sternberg got these experts, different people uh, in different fields of psychology to write what their analysis of how it could be that smart people could be so stupid. And then he asked me to read all of the chapters that have been accumulated and write an overarching chapter at the beginning of the book on why Putting, see if I can put together all the theories that the other people had and write a chapter, and I did. And that was, so I write the introductory chapters there, oh, to the wrong one. And I concluded that smart people can be wrong and stupid just because they're so smart, which is the basis of this thing as well. In other words, they can now, starting with the wrong basis of information, if they are now have brains and have intelligent the kind of smartness to be able to do it, they can use that basis to very cleverly uh, argue for their position, which is wrong, and make it even worse. Uh, so one of the ironies of that smart people can be so stupid just because they're so stupid. Well, isn't there a similar type of thing that they may even be arrogant about, I'm so smart, therefore somebody's not capable of fooling me? That could be, yes, could be. Also, the, uh, what uh, Kathy is saying, which is a good point, is that there's also a motivational part, a, um, uh, a, a self-importance aspect to this, that I am so smart, I, you know, my self-image is so smart that uh, it, it, it's unlikely no one's going to be able to fool me. And of course, magicians and deceivers of all kinds, scammers, love that kind of thing. It turns out that the famous, most famous book on, on con artists was written during the 30s by um, uh, David Maurer. Uh, called The Big Con, uh, and later was republished as the American Conference Man. Uh, he was a professor at the uh, University of Louisville, uh, and uh, professor of English was interested in the language of the underworld. And uh, as he wrote several books on the argot, as he calls it, of, of pickpockets and the different language that um, uh, housebreakers had, each, each subgenre of, of uh, Outlaw had a different uh, kind of a language, and he, he called it Argot, and he wrote books on them, uh, compiled them as an English professor who was interested in that. But one day, uh, it used to be on the, some Sundays, while he was resting at home, somebody would drive up to the school in Bentley and come and knock on the front door and say, Hey, we got to talk to you. You, you've got the language of all, you've been publishing on language of different kinds of criminals and stuff like that, but you missed us, because we don't ever get caught. <laughs> We're the confidence men. They're very proud of themselves. And they're con artists. And as, as they talk to him and try to teach him about their language, uh, they taught him a lot about what they do. So he got very fascinated in the psychology of how they do it and what goes on that way. And uh, in his book, The Big Con, which is still a fascinating book to read, uh, he shows that the most easiest, the people that other conference, that conference men can most fool are other conference men. 
because they know how to get the guy's mind works too. They can take advantage of it. Uh, and also, conference men think they're the cream of the crop. They're so smart that they, that they can't be fooled. And that, uh, that makes me more vulnerable to another con artist. By the way, second most successful people to be conned are, I think it was clergymen, and uh, then uh, bankers. Uh, uh, anyway. Okay, I got five minutes. So that's what the Matthew effect is. And um, what, the, what, what is implied by the term false beliefs? I don't, I don't False really belief? Yeah, is, I mean, is, is it, are they trying to imply that there's such things as a true belief? Or, I mean, like well, with, belief? With, with that going, without going down that path, I'm like, just in philosophy, it's justified true belief. But Ray, would you, if you have five minutes, would you mind just focusing on the replicability thing? Because I think that's, that's my last lecture. That, yeah. I, but I'm not in my last lecture. Oh, no, I, I, then I misunderstood. I, I thought, mean, this, this is the next to the last lecture. Yeah, <laughs> I thought this lecture was the importance of replicability. No, no, this is the last lecture. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not there yet. Don't rush me. Oh, no. Well, maybe I'm misreading the lecture nine. I mean, it says lecture, it says the importance of replicability. That's, that's lecture 10. Well, not, not in the handout. You mispronounced it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, they, what they did was, I had a, a heading for each pair of lectures, and that was the heading for the pair of lectures. They, they've they've re-edited this some way. I can show you my original one. Okay. So I'm always right. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> okay, so I have, what, one minute, two minutes? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground in some ways, and some ways not so much, maybe. But everything is pointed to making sure we've got good data. And the reasons why we want to make that, why it's hard to get good data, and the, some of the reasons are because we are cognitive misers, and, that, and the other reasons are because of the lack of adequate mindware or having mindware that's contaminated. In other words, so uh, from there, I'm going to go just one step further, because we've been talking as if you can do an experiment that's going to give you adequate data, good data. And it turns out that's not true. A single experiment, no matter how good it is, even though there are people like to talk about crucial experiments and stuff like that, there's no such thing. Because as I said at the beginning, science is inductive and it's a probabilistic thing. And the best experiment in the world could have unanticipated reasons why it is wrong and also, just by flukes, things can be wrong. But uh, because of auxiliary conditions, initial conditions, you can't handle everything, a single experiment by itself is not sufficient to give you the kind of data you want. This is the importance of replicability. And I'm gonna get to that next lecture and show you how pseudo-replicability, -repli I think I'll call it, I just made up that word, uh, can, get, can, can create a whole field which has lasted for over 150 years or so called parapsychology. That's what we do next.